Good afternoon um, from Hong Kong. Uh, David is, I think, saying good morning from, from, from Paris. Um, welcome back, everybody, to day two of the annual conference of the Berkeley Center on Comparative Equality and Anti-Discrimination Law, which is hosted by the University of Hong Kong. We have another very full day today, uh, but hopefully it will be much easier for participants who are joining us from Africa and from Europe. Um, and at least some of the sessions should be at, at somewhat reasonable hours for those zooming in from other continents. Um, I'm very pleased to begin today's activities with a keynote presentation by Professor Vitet Munteborn. Um, and I've been actually wanting to uh, have him give a talk for us for a very long time. So this is really very special for me. Um, He'll be introduced by the chair of the session, Professor Sophie Robin Olivier from the Sorbonne Law Faculty. So without further ado, I'll hand things over to Sophie to get us started. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really nice to be with everybody from a distance. So um, I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Vitik Montabon, um, who is a professor of international law uh, Professor Emeritus at the Faculty of Law of Kuala Lumpur in Bangkok. And uh, Professor Muntaborn has served in many uh, United Nations bodies. I cannot list all of them, but he is uh, uh, currently the UN Special Reporter for uh, the Situation of Human Rights in Cambodia. He's been in charge of this same task in other for other countries. Uh, he has also been, and I think it's particularly important, a special reporter for uh, of the UN Commission on Human Rights on the Sale of Children, Child Prostitution, and Child Pornography. And he was also uh, a UN independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, so with all of that, he also uh, wrote recently a, a particularly interesting book called Challenges of International Law in the Asian region. So that's uh, the latest, 2021, 20, uh, if I am right. So Professor Mintabon, we're very happy uh, to listen to your presentation, which is called Microverse, Metaverse, and Micro, uh, Macroverse, Protection Against Discrimination in an artificial, Artificialized World. And you have 30 minutes so that we can discuss for uh, the same amount of time with you and uh, ask you a series of questions. So thank you very much again. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon from Bangkok uh, to our friends in France and elsewhere. Bonjour, uh, c'est un grand plaisir de vous rencontrer. Uh, and thank you very much to Hong Kong for organizing this and for enabling me to participate. It's a great pleasure and honor. I thought I'd choose a, um, rather fashionable uh, topic, um, which is um, based on the word verse. Everybody wants to discuss the word verse. And verse is somewhat poetic, but I thought I'd add some poetry by sort of reinventing um, some prefixes such as micro, mezzo, and macro. And that's what you have as the title of the presentation. So I hope you'll enjoy it and then I hope we'll have a good time for discussions. Protection against discrimination is increasingly interfacing with an artificialized world in the form of automation, algorithms, and artificial intelligence, AI, closely aligned with mutating digitalization. While traditional advocacy against discrimination was interlinked with the call for specific anti-discrimination -discrimin laws, coupled with other actions. In today's world, there is another entry point in the form of emerging personal data protection laws, which should be explored. These can help to safeguard privacy in relation to personal data, which also adds to protection against discrimination. However, this panorama straddles two stools, the right to advocacy and the right to freedom of expression covering data flows which must be balanced well in the process. There are a trio of concerns which condition responses in this respect. First, there's the issue of scale 
in regard to the micro, mezzo, and macro. The variety of operations in the form of digital platforms and related intermediaries range from the very large scale to medium scale and small scale. The word verse adds to that spectrum the universe of challenges and global coverage in the process. Where there are rules to ensure fairness, obviously they should address first and foremost the mega entities which shall remain nameless in this presentation. With possibly less or more flexible regulation of the medium and small scale. The trio of concerns also calls for action from three key actors, the state, the business sector, and consumers who are most often the data subjects whose data might be jeopardized by the digitalization where it impinges on the right to privacy. Actions needed to ensure viable equilibrium between privacy, expression, business interests, and digital access for users range from the national to the regional and the international or multilateral. They are exemplified by various new laws at the national level, regional initiatives to have a common front between neighboring countries and international standards which bear on the issue, such as on human rights, cybercrime laws, and data protection. Concretely nearer to my home in Bangkok, the issue of privacy, especially safeguarding personal data, which are linked with a person's identity and related protection against multiple forms of discrimination, has come to the fore this month due to the coming into force of Thailand's Personal Data Protection Act, or PDPA. It applies to both public and private entities that keep or process personal data concerning other people and it establishes safeguards to protect people's privacy. The Thai PDVA is derived heavily from developments in the European Union, EU, especially its General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, which came into force in 2018. The latter has impact on Thais and Thai companies involved in activities in the EU in this regard. The EU has also agreed to enact a new law in 2022 in the form of the Digital Services Act, which will counter illegal goods online and help to expose algorithms which might have impact on the right to privacy. In reality, all regions of Go are faced with mutating digitalization, which raises new challenges. The most obvious is extended reality, ER, ER which offers simulated immersive experiences to users, such as through special goggles and headsets, offering a variety of services with the appearance of avatars, but which collect delicate data simultaneously, such as eye movements, nose twitches, and facial expressions. Key emerging issues thus deserve to be highlighted. First, there's the need for the data controller or processor to obtain the consent of the data subject who is identified by the data. This consent principle is an essential prerequisite of the relationship between the parties concerned. Yet it should be based on informed consent, which means that the data controller in particular should offer some of the essential information for the person to decide whether to consent to have the data, personal data retained and or revealed. In today's world, even the notion of informed consent is not necessarily adequate as the rise of extended reality, ER, has opened a Pandora's box in regard to the vast amount of data collected and the multiple uses, both positive and negative, which may arise. A critical danger is the psychography, psychography, which is the psychological mapping of the data subject, which may lead to psychological and other profiling resulting in discrimination against the person. Consumer participation is thus pivotal to enable the data subject to be cautious about the consequences. A better approach perhaps is thus to advocate the consent plus, consent plus principle, which calls for the consent factor to be coupled with other measures such as consumer consciousness and easy readability of the contractual terms which shape the consent factor. Second, the right to privacy is not absolute, and some data can be revealed for legitimate purposes, even without the consent 
of the data subject. The usual limitations on the right to privacy include national security and public health. There are also possible exceptions in regard to the need to use data for research, historical, and statistical reasons. Yet here too, safeguards are needed against overzealous exposure of personal data for so-called legitimate purposes. International human rights principles instruct that these purposes must not be arbitrary, that's the principle of legality, and that those invoking them must prove that the use of exposure of the data is genuinely necessary, the principle of necessity, and proportionate to the circumstances, the principle of proportionality. A key area of concern is that these purposes are often linked with surveillance of those who are seen as dissidents or opponents of those in power. The political implications are all too obvious in non-democratic states, especially when coupled with single internet gateway laws and cybersecurity laws of a state-centric kind. Third, there's the principle of data minimization, which means that those who collect the data should collect the minimum and not the maximum. And this is related to the need to prove functionality in relation to the data collection and use. Yet what is advocated as minimal in a world of mutating digitalization is complex. If the manufacturer of those goggles and related platform owners claim that, quote, it's to enhance the entertainment, unquote, of those enjoying the game on that simulated screen, the public should not forget the psychological implications of addiction and possible neurological impact in terms of psychofixations, which may ensue. The targeting of vulnerabilities of specific groups, such as children, needs to be addressed. An innovation of the EU's new act is to prevent that targeting and impose more controls on whatever data are collected. Fourth, there's the issue of cumulative data and their impact. This is much related to the new digitalization which collects such minute data which may appear innocuous as if singled out for some purposes, but which are dangerous when accumulated as aggregate data. The latter might lead to clandestine conclusions, which interrelate with matters of race, color, gender, sexual orientation, and the social and political origins of the data subject. The scenario is also changing today because extended reality, ER, is able to collect not only data of the person using those goggles, but also data on bystanders without the latter being in the know about the implied surveillance. And fifth, on a more encouraging note, there's now not only the emphasis on various rights in relation to privacy with the new legal developments, but also the call for due diligence and accountability of the business sector in the process. The new Thai law, together with the advent of laws in other countries, Hong Kong has one too, I think, embeds various rights to help the data subject. These include the right to access the data, the right to erase the data, originally known in Europe as the right to be forgotten, the right to rectify the data and the right to data portability to transfer the data. The door is open to the platform industry and related industries to adopt, adopt due diligence measures to assess the potential impact of their operations and to prevent or mitigate the harm. Protection against discrimination can be part of explicit prohibition or implicit provision. An example of the latter is that as derived from EU law, in the case of the Thai PDPA, if there are violations of the Thai Act, those responsible, especially the data controller, must inform the state authorities within 72 hours to initiate action to mitigate the harm. However, on areas of vulnerability, such as race, ethnicity, and gender, defected persons must also be informed within that period to trigger protection. The sanctions can be quite daunting for violators. In Thailand, there are both civil damages and criminal sentences, in Europe, especially for those mega companies that reach out to over 45 million customers, the fines for breaches could amount to some 4% of their massive annual global turnover. In future, even 6% under the new EU Digital Services Act. What then are some options for the future in relation to needed actions against discrimination and the right to privacy and its protection? First, there is the possibility of co-regulation. This dictates not only laws, policies, and good practices under the umbrella of the state, or in the case of this region, 
ASEAN, Southeast Asia, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or elsewhere, the European Union and beyond, and multilaterally linked to the UN, but also action from the business sector itself and cooperation between the state and that sector. Codes of conduct are emerging as part of self-regulation from the digital industry with standards set by the industry, together with risk and situational assessment and access to remedies. Understandably, however, there are skeptics who question whether codes and self-regulation really work or whether they're merely a superficial gloss to justify business operations. It may thus be necessary to call for more than self-regulation and aim for co-regulation. To be validated by the latter, industry codes would have to be tested to see whether they comply with statal, regional, and or international standards, and whether they might be accepted explicitly by the frameworks that shape those standards, such as the European Data Protection System, with the EU Commission at the pinnacle of that system. A rare example of validation on this front was seen in relation to the Belgian Code of Conduct on cloud services, which was accepted by the EU. Inherently, it integrates due diligence measures, such as assessment to ensure compliance with common standards and accountability measures if there are breaches. Another angle of co-regulation could be cooperation between the state and the business sector, together with consumer stakeholders, to notify cases of breaches and cross refer between each other for action. Across borders, there may need to be mutual legal assistance agreements to facilitate such cooperation. Second, the call for oversight and watchdogs. This is evident at all levels, national, regional, and multilateral. The new EU Digital Services Act is particularly interesting because it will set up a system of so-called flaggers, which may be governmental or non-governmental entities, helping to check the situation and report transgressions to the national authorities. The latter then linked with various EU entities on data protection for further leverage or replication if there are discrepancies with concomitant redress. Third, built-in technological safeguards and prohibitions of some types of technology are also advisable. An example of the former is that the EER headsets, extended reality headsets, should integrate into the headgear protection against data collection on sensitive issues such as skin color and ethnicity. It should inform bystanders that they may be affected by the surveillance capacity of the machines in the vicinity. If those goggles are really consumer savvy, they should build into the machinery a warning label or precautionary video, which will run automatically before the user is immersed in all those digital paraphernalia. And on another front, some machines should be prohibited altogether. And there's been a move in this regard, in regard to, uh, in relation to, for example, automated, self-automated killer robots, as well as long distance facial recognition technology used for surveillance. A new concern is to expose the algorithms, which may lead to profiling with implications for discrimination and or negative targeting, as well as to enable consumers to know whether they are dealing with robots with their fate determined by AI, artificial intelligence. Fourth, empowerment of the digital subject or consumer lobby is essential not only as part of their stakeholdership, but also as respect for self-protection and self-determination. On the one hand, this may depend upon education of the public to be aware of the implications of the new digitalization. On the other hand, there's a need to offer technological labeling so as to enable consumers to choose whether or not to be exposed to the risks in using that technology. Fifth, an effective monitoring system coupled with notice and notification of breaches as well as oversight mechanism is required. This was mentioned partly early on with the emerging presence of flaggers in the EU together with oversight bodies at the national and regional levels as part of official law of the region. From the angle of self-regulation, the possibility of having an oversight board has already been used extensively by at least one of the mega mega platforms. And it deals with millions of cases, usually when information is taken down as part of content moderation, as part of either illegal or harmful information, so to speak. It validated the suspension of a former president of a very big country from its digital pages for two years for inciting violence, which had led to a failed insurrection in the capital city of that country. Initially, there was no limit on the ban, but now it's two years. The jury's out in regard to whether that advice from the board was sound or not. Should the ban have been longer or shorter? 
Such mechanism is not an alternative for justice systems, however, with proven independence and effectiveness. The latter is still required as part of access to justice. Sixth, care is required to distinguish between the ban on illegal information and action needed on harmful information. With regard to the former, there's already broad consensus, consensus on areas where a ban is needed. For example, child pornography, incitement to hatred linked with violence or discrimination, and incitement to genocide. The most complete international treaty on this front is the so-called Budapest Convention on Cyber Crimes, which is open to ratification by not only European countries, but also others from other regions. Asian participants include Japan and Sri Lanka. Platforms may, however, adopt self-regulation policy to screen out harmful information, which might not be tantamount to illegality in international law. For example, various types of hate speech, which do not fulfill the requisites of incitement to hatred under the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights, its Article 20 in particular. Freedom of expression has to be borne in mind, as per Article 19 of that covenant, which calls for broad-mindedness even where the information is offensive. From another dimension, in less than democratic countries, there are various computer crimes related laws or fake news related laws, which con confer far too much discretion on the state authorities to criminalize, quote, misleading or, quote, embarrassing data. These may be tantamount to censorship or self-censorship in breach of international standards. Seventh, there's the encouragement that the industry should undertake due diligence measures ex ante and prepare to provide remedies ex post in keeping with the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights. This can be complemented by national policies to direct state agencies and the business community as exemplified by Thailand's adoption of its national plan on business and human rights, which is the first plan appearing in the Asian region. Basically, the plan targets four areas of concern and they are obviously linked with the need for accountability and responsive data, namely on labor rights, environmental conservation, sustainable investment, and protection of human rights defenders. The remedies can be both informal, such as through mediation, and formal, such as through courts. Eighth, there is the need for specific protection of vulnerabilities. These interrelate with race, ethnicity, color, disability, gender, age, sexual diversity, gender uh, diversity and the like, social and political links, and other characteristics. <coughs> It is wise to view the presence of personal data protection law as one of the means of protection against abuse and violence, especially where it helps to prohibit the targeting of groups such as children for exploitative or abusive commercial purposes related with data utilization and related marketing. This law is not a substitute for specific purposes, for specific legislation offering protection, and it goes hand in hand with the wider coverage demanded by the various international human rights treaties on these issues such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, these three are the most ratified international human rights conventions in the Asian region today. There may also be a need for temporary special protection measures to elevate the status of those groups. Ninth, in a world of increasing lifelong surveillance, which is already emerging in some countries, which use data to hold people captive under the opaque systems prevailing over them, it is important to work towards data systems that help to counter that surveillance. A related area requested particularly by civil society is capacity building on digital security to ward off the threats of invasive scrutiny by state security personnel in less than open settings. And 10th, finally, in the advocacy to implement well the various rights mentioned around the right to privacy, which can also be a benefit to the protection against discrimination, there's a need for strong checks and balances against the use of power, including data power. National mechanisms of an independent kind, that's good courts, national human rights commissions, and data supervisors can contribute to fulfilling this role. They can be complemented by mechanisms at the regional and multilateral levels to leverage for respect for human rights and democracy. This is an area hopefully to be explored in my region by ASEAN, but is now dampened by the presence of several non-democratic countries as members, unfortunately. The data industry itself needs to be demonopolized and anti-competitive practices should be counted by well-rounded laws, policies, and practices based on pluralism. As importantly, 
there's the need for a well-synchronized civil society that can utilize well its power and the power of social media, both to help prevent and remedy violations as part of responsive digitalized public opinion and concerted constructive speech. All in all, the human touch is still essential to offer that sense of consciousness and conscience. Those elements are essential elixirs for the increasingly artificialized world to ensure that it is well anchored in the universality of human rights, embedded with a vitalizing, vitalizing sense of humanity for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. It was uh, extraordinarily interesting, so rich, so informative, this presentation. Um, I'm really um, having the feeling that it's uh, particularly important to be a, an international law and a comparative law professor in this field, as you cannot see things from just the narrow uh, point of view of a, of a national uh, law specialist. Um, also, I find, I must say, in your presentation, um, I find it uh, quite interesting that you're using so much the EU uh, as a reference in terms of development of, of the law in this domain. And I think, uh, you know, it makes me a bit proud from <laughs> for being a European myself. Um, and it's interesting that you're quoting all these instruments, the, of course, the well-known uh, GDPR, but it's still, you know, it's already in the past as it looks from for, for now that, and I see that uh, you've been referring uh, extensively to the, the DSA, uh, Digital Services Act, uh, soon to be uh, in, in force, and then the the project of a regulation on uh, artificial intelligence. All these uh, point at these very crucial issues that you're mentioning today. I think it's really the, the core of the uh, the concerns for for most of us human rights uh, who are concerned with human rights and and, and discriminations. Uh, and all these uh, instruments and, and, and developments that you're, uh, you're having now also in, in the Asian region, uh, it's, it's all a source of uh, many, many questions. Uh, as for me, reading the, uh, the project on uh, AI, AI uh, it's both super interesting to see you know, all the, uh, that you're mentioning, the type of regulation that is uh, figured out, but at the same time, it's opening uh, uh, you know, the, the the universe of, of new questions. So uh, I think we have plenty on our plate to discuss. Uh, and it's, it's going to be for years that we will discuss what's, what's really happening. It's, for me, it's not clear yet, you know, how, how this will all function together. But obviously there is a series of different types of instruments that will um, play out together. So um, I don't want to uh, monopolize <laughs> the conversation. I, I'd like everyone to, to contribute. So that the floor is for whoever wants to talk. I see there's a hand. Uh...